Soul Calibur is a series that is packed full of silly tradition. From the narrator's voice hesitating to say each game's number at the title screen, Soul Calibur 2. Soul Calibur 3. The pre fight inspirational quotes, Her graceful sword dance cuts through enemies. She chooses her path like a free bird. A character creator that lets you create absolute abominations, and a cast of characters that range from a stone faced samurai to an Elvis impersonator, a BDSM queen that uses a whip for a weapon because, of course, she does, and Valdo. Soul Calibur's strength lies in the fact that all of this goofiness is wrapped in a completely serious veneer, on top of the fact that it's generally been a pretty good fighting game series. But this video is about one of the Soul Calibur traditions that I actually enjoy the most. Ever since the third game in the series, there have been crossover characters from inside and outside of the world of video games. So in this video, I'll take you on a trip through the stage of history to discuss the guest characters of Soul Calibur 2. If you haven't yet, shoot a subscription my way on YouTube, ring the bell, and follow me on Twitter at StumbleBTV. The wait is over. Let's begin! The console versions of Soul Calibur 2 released in 2003, an age where console wars were still raging and middle-aged school children took their friends to task on the consoles that they owned with a level of vitriol that would make Chad Warden blush. That said, Namco didn't exactly create peace among the fanboys when they introduced not one, not two, but three guest characters in Soul Calibur 2, one for each console the game released on. In the year of our sword 2002, the trio of Namco, Sega, and Nintendo all got together to create an arcade board known as the Triforce. The board itself was based off of the GameCube's architecture, and was critical in making titles like the arcade versions of F-Zero and Mario Kart into a reality. And it's from these discussions that we get our first deal for a console-exclusive guest character in the form of the hero of time, The Legend of Zelda's very own Link based off of his Adult Link version from Ocarina of Time, and more recently, the 2000 Space World GameCube tech demo. Before I go any further, I should say that Soul Calibur stands on the shoulders of a well-crafted, well-balanced, weapon-based combat system. Long weapons have range, short weapons have speed, and etc, etc. Often the weapons these characters use are very closely tied to their identities. So what weapon do you think that a GameCube-exclusive character like Link would use? The Master Sword, right? Well, yes, but actually no. Within the single-player modes of Soul Calibur 2 lies Weapon Master. I already covered the basics in my Evolution of Single-Player Content video. I'll link the video in the description below. But if you need a quick refresher or have never played it before, you fight against AI opponents under different parameters and restrictions for in-game gold. You then use that gold to purchase upgrades and a variety of weapons for each character in the game. So yes, while Link's default weapon is the very same sort of Hyrule legend, you can actually use swords, shields, and other items from throughout the history of the Legend of Zelda series, each with their own unique quirks based off of the games that they came from. Take for example the Razor Sword from Majora's Mask. More powerful than Link's starter sword, its one weakness is a tendency to wear down and break over time, reverting back to its original form. So Namco brings it over to Soul Calibur 2 and gives it the same buff and attack power, but just as in Majora's Mask, replicates its tendency to fail under scrutiny by letting through a small amount of damage when blocking. Another example is a link from the past in the Cane of Birna. In the SNES Classic, the magical staff would shield Link from enemy and trap damage. In Soul Calibur 2, executing a soul charge with the cane equipped would refill a portion of Link's health, at the cost of lower damage and a tendency to lose trades. This kind of series accurate give and take can be found for just about every one of Link's different weapons. Outside of his main arsenal though, most of the rest of Link's move list may feel familiar to Zelda veterans. Link can use moves like his jumping downward stab, his spin attack, his bow and arrow, bombs, and my personal favorite, the Boomerang, which can put your opponents in some pretty tricky situations. 
All in all, Link is really the only Nintendo character that made sense to put in a game like Soul Calibur 2. Namco was basically handed a ready-made character on a silver platter, complete with a great moveset and a variety of weapons with storied histories. But still, they get points for a great transition between genres and for putting Link into his very first fighting game. So now let's talk about the PlayStation version. Much like Nintendo, Sony had a large roster of potential guest candidates. Since the PS1 release in 1995, they've done a great job of making many characters feel essential to the PlayStation brand, even though many weren't actually conceptualized and developed by Sony themselves. So who was it gonna be? Well, it was brought to light on a 2017 edition of the 8-4 podcast on GiantBomb.com that Cloud Strife of Final Fantasy fame was almost Sony's representative in Soul Calibur 2, until the deal fell apart at the finish line. Oh wait, was it? No, it's been it's so like, long. You know, I'm an EP yeah. at no, Ubisoft. What are you gonna do? You can't. You're untouchable now. You're yeah. untouchable. You're <laughs> sure. a made no, man of the mob. Because originally, apparently, they were working out a deal with uh, Cloud. Actually, <sighs> oh my god, and, fucking and, genius move! I know, no, oh it would have been, it would have been incredible, it's genius. right? Genius, yeah, yeah absolutely. And they're like, no, we need him for air guys. Like, he's, he's <laughs> no, taken. and like, apparently, like at god the last ring. minute, at the last minute, it got it, it fell got through. Canned. Oh man, and that so, is heart wrenching. Okay, well then, they're, they're they're I'm gonna get a call from Namco, aren't I? They're yeah. for and he would have been a fantastic choice. For years, Final Fantasy VII was a system seller, widely considered to be one of the best games of all time. And with plenty of unique weapons and a whole lot of design space to make cool moves that borrow from the source material, Cloud would have been a fantastic fit. But ultimately, it didn't come to pass. So Namco had to find a new guest character and find them fast. But they didn't have to look too far, because in Cloud's place, the Soul Calibur team was able to borrow Tekken's Heihachi Mishima, from their co-workers a few cubicles down. If you're eager to die, that's fine by me. You may be a worthy opponent. Heihachi still made sense as a PlayStation representative. After all, the Tekken series was founded on the Namco System 11 arcade board, which was the technology that the PlayStation 1 was based off of. The similarities between the PS1 and that arcade board made it possible for easy ports to console, which is why the Tekken series has always had a place in the house that Sony built. Heihachi is the first and only weaponless main roster character in a Soul Calibur game, and the first and only main roster guest character to be from another fighting game franchise. So in a game about weapon-on-weapon -weapon combat, how does a character who doesn't have any use for weapons work? Well, in lieu of a blader staff, the Elder Mishima dons some pretty simple wrist guards but none of them actually have any history or significance to the world of Tekken either. The only one that even comes close is Heihachi's ultimate weapon, also named Tekken, and that's not even a weapon. Rather, it's the lack of a weapon because he takes the guards off when you use it. So let me just put this out here. If anybody says one thing to you, I will crush their skull. My hands are lethal weapons. Uh, okay, guys, enough, all right. Looking at his moveset, the gang's just about all here. He still has all of his signature moves and long strings and even some 10-hit combos. But this Heihachi plays a fair bit differently than other versions of himself. Not only does the old Tekken control standard of one button equals one limb not apply, but Soul Calibur is a completely different type of fighting game with a totally different engine. So you won't be juggling someone across the stage with jabs like you would in Tekken 4. But regardless, he still hits like a damn truck with big time damage on relatively simple combos. With moves like his up forward KK being a nightmare to defend against, and Electric Wind Godfist being plus on block and hitting mid for some godforsaken reason, we're probably pretty lucky that console exclusivity kept him out of tournaments, because we would have probably seen a lot of him if he were able to compete. Looking back, it seemed kind of puzzling that with Heihachi flying the PS2 flag and Link holding down the fort for Nintendo, Master Chief, the pride and joy of Microsoft, wasn't considered for the spot on the Xbox version of Soul Calibur 2. Unfortunately, it seemed like it all came down to a matter of timing. The Xbox and Halo Combat Evolved launched in 2001. The arcade version of Soul Calibur 2 released in 2002, with the console versions launching a year later in 2003. 
Despite the fact that Halo was selling well at the time, it was still a very new franchise on a very new platform, and it wasn't known if the momentum would continue with later releases. Microsoft didn't have a mascot for their console ecosystem, and Namco couldn't afford to wait around with the release of the Soul Calibur 2 home game right around the corner. So they had to find some character to be the flag bearer for the Xbox brand. But the funny part about that is that the character actually found them. Todd McFarlane is a prolific comic book artist. He's worked at Marvel and DC, authoring and illustrating comic books for famous superheroes like Spider-Man and Batman. He was a rising star on the comic book world in the early 90s, so after a spat with management at Marvel, he went on to create his own comic book publisher, Image Comics, and it was there that the world would be introduced to the character that would eventually become the third guest character in Soul Calibur 2, Spawn. If you take a look at anything Todd McFarlane has ever been involved in, you can tell that Spawn is his pride and joy. Think about the thing that you love the most. Now double that. That's the amount of love that this guy gets out of Spawn. After all, he conceptualized the character at 16 years old, and it shows. Spawn looks like the embodiment of every teenager's drawings in the margins of their schoolwork, with a brooding past, a grim dark personality, and a disposition that puts him about three steps away from becoming a store manager at a hot topic. Needless to say that McFarlane puts Spawn in just about everything he can from movies and video games, action figures, merchandise, and more. So in the early 2000s, McFarlane was shopping Spawn around to different game studios to see if anyone would be interested in making another game based off of his edgy little baby. And he eventually found a suitor in Namco, who just so happened to be looking for a company to produce a toy line for Soul Calibur 2. As luck would have it, Todd McFarlane is also the owner of McFarlane Toys, one of the most popular action figure and toy manufacturers. And because Todd was already a fan of Soul Calibur before, everything seemed to work out for everyone involved. So Namco agreed to produce McFarlane's game, and even asked him to design an all-new character for Soul Calibur 2, who we'll get to in a second. And of course, they asked McFarlane for the right to put Spawn in their new game, which he obviously agreed to. Unfortunately, Spawn's presence in Soul Calibur 2 feels a little inconsistent and a bit half-cocked. If you know anything about this character, you should know that his bread and butter items are his iconic cape and chain combo. But Namco actually had to cut back on both of those weapons due to their intricate nature and the lack of processing power on the Xbox to handle the physics that both of Spawn's main symbols would need. Luckily, Namco still had an out, because Spawn's cape, Agony, is actually a living being able to transform into anything that its wearer needs which is why Spawn wields a battle axe against the characters of Soul Calibur 2. His in-game motivations line up with the motivations from the comics, and he can fly around and throw fireballs, which are powers that he does canonically have. His alternate costume is based off of a mid-90s comic book arc where Spawn gets batarangd in the goddamn face, which is a deep cut that fans of the series will appreciate, but after reading some comics and doing some more research, I think the biggest missed opportunity for this character has to do with his weapons. I mean, Spawn definitely has used axes before, so I was expecting at least a medieval version of his main weapon, but there doesn't seem to be anything like that in this game. As a matter of fact, it doesn't seem like any of his weapons are references to the deep history and lore of the Spawn franchise. The only tenuous link I was able to find was that one of his weapons is named Redeemer which, correct me if I'm wrong, but that just so happens to share a name with one of his enemies. So if you can tell if there are any direct references to Spawn or characters within that universe in his alternate weapons or playstyle, please feel free to let me know in the comments below. There, you happy? Lastly, I wanted to talk about the first pseudo-guest character in the Soul Calibur series. I say pseudo because there exists a character in Soul Calibur 2 that was designed specifically for this game by someone other than Namco. That character is Necrid. Designed by Todd McFarlane as a part of his deal with Namco, Necrid is a large, gross-looking abomination of a fighting game character with inhuman origins that looks more at home in a comic book. Which, say what you will about Todd McFarlane, he is nothing if not consistent. Did you know that Necrid was actually banned in tournament play along with Link, Heihachi, and Spawn? During the game's heyday, balance changes were tested on the arcade version of Soul Calibur 2, 
and being exclusive to the console version, characters like Necrid, Lizardman, Songmina, and Sophitia went untested in a competitive setting and were banned as a result. Years later, the community eventually unbanned most of those characters, but Necrid stayed banned as a result of allegedly being an out-and-out -out busted character, seeing bans in major tournaments like Evolution 2004. However, the community seems to have eased up on the big boy lifting his ban at more recent tournaments like Combo Breaker 2019. But unlike the other three guest characters from this game, Necrid is actually a canon presence in the narrative of Soul Calibur 2. The long and short of it is that Necrid was once a human warrior who fought and failed to defeat Soul Edge. He was trapped in the abyss known as the Astral Chaos, eventually making his way out. But due to the physical and psychological hardships that the Shadow Realm inflicted upon him, he found himself in immense pain until he was able to gather the shards of the Soul Edge. And once he did that, he defeated Inferno, reopened the portal, and hopped back into the void, never to be seen again. Necrid's disappearance into the Astral Chaos is likely to be the last time we ever see the Monster Man in Soul Calibur, unless we also get spawned to make a comeback as well. That's because while Namco outlined and programmed Necrid into Soul Calibur 2, they were only following the designs and concepts of his creator, Todd McFarlane, who owns a partial copyright along with Namco, effectively splitting the ownership of the character in two. For proof, look no further than the title screen of Soul Calibur 2, which clearly indicates a collaboration between the two parties. And when Necrid has been brought up for interviews and subsequent entries in the Soul Calibur series, Producers haven't really been shy about the fate of the character, saying that Necrid is, quote, on a permanent vacation, which is a pretty funny image to think about. Two of the three console exclusive guests of this game live on in Soul Calibur 2 HD for the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. Nintendo have been somewhat generous with their characters, but it looks like letting Link play on their competitors' consoles is a step too far. The only way that I see the guest trio fighting against each other all at once is if Soul Calibur 2 HD gets ported to the Switch. And with Tekken showing up on the Wii U, and Todd McFarlane's need to shove Spawn into every nook and cranny in existence, that idea is honestly not that far-fetched. This won't be the last of the Soul Calibur videos that I bring you. You can look forward to at least two more about the guests of Soul Calibur coming in the future, and I'm incredibly proud of the work that I've put into them thus far, and I think you'll really enjoy them. So for now, once again, my name is Stumblebee, and you can support me on Patreon, subscribe to me on YouTube, or following me on Twitter. Have a good night, everyone.